This will be easy looking at you. It's fun to look, look at on? you, Mr. Floyd Pincus. And today is July 9th, 2010. Uh, my name is Teresa Beer Larson, and I'm speaking with Floyd Pincus, who's a longtime Ames resident, a successful business person in this town. Floyd, let's go back a few years. Would okay. you please tell me your birth date, including the year and where you were born? Uh, my, my birthday was June 19, 1919. I was born in Templeton, Iowa, uh, a, a little city of 350 people in western Iowa, and there were about five or six of those towns around. It was, quite, it was very interesting. Roselle and Halber and Dedham and uh, Coon Rapids was a little bit bigger, but they, they're all, most of the other towns, around 300, 350 people, and they all had a Catholic church with a very high, whatever you call that, spile going up, yeah. And your dad, as I understand it, had a general store, a kind of a dry goods um, supply store, is that and right? Not so much dry goods, it's mostly he catered to the farmer's uh, clothing, uh, the, the work shoes, the coveralls, uh, boots, uh, mm -hmm. overshoes, all, all that sort of thing. And then a line of IGA grocers, uh, that's a national firm. And uh, then just not much for the women except hosiery. He did have a, a line of hosiery for the gals or the women. No, no ladies' clothing, though. Did you work in the store? Oh, yes. Uh, I, uh, I think we were nicknamed the prune prune something, prune bucket, prune shippers, prune baggers, prune something like that. But yeah, I had two brothers, and we all three worked. And I, I had one brother older uh, than me, two and a half years, and one younger. I, I didn't get to see the younger one work there very often because, uh, well, I was gone at a pretty young age, and he was mm -hmm. just coming in. But we, we all three worked there. And we had one bicycle for delivery that, we, that the three of us shared. Tell me how the bicycle delivery worked. Well, it was uh, just if, uh, for instance, if Mrs. Dozler called in for a loaf of bread, we would put the loaf of bread in and bike three or four blocks to her house and deliver it to her. And that was routine. It's amazing how much people expected and, and how much we did to accommodate them. But we delivered groceries and all that thing. Is that possible that some of that customer service may have influenced you later in your life? Oh, I certainly think so, yeah, mm -hmm. because I would be uh, disappointed if I went into a store and, and I was just the opposite. You had to do everything. Mm -hmm. But, so yeah, I, I do think my dad taught me service. Mm -hmm. He really did. And uh, I, know, I know you worked hard, but tell me about having fun when you were a kid in Templeton. Say, uh, how about in the winter? What did you do in the winter? Oh, winter wonderland. We had lots of fun. We Skating... Uh, not, skating was barely uh, uh, there, but we didn't have many places to skate. But snowing, we would go out in the country and and find a hill and walk out that you know to that hill. Like uh, I can I can remember the most popular place was Pete Klein's uh, farmland, and. Uh, we would go out there, oh, eight or ten of us in a gang, go out and go down that hill and walk back up and go back down the hill. And sometimes we'd gang up two or three on a sled and sometimes individually. But I would, I would say uh, sledding was a very important part of the kid's life there. You know. And you, um, I remember you were saying something about sleigh rides. You'd kind of get a little... Um, Hitch on a ride out of town on a sleigh? How did that oh, work? Oh, that was fun. Uh, we, you know, in the grocery store, a farmer would be parked out in front. We have heavy chain on three trees, and that, that's where they hit, hitched up there. But anyway, we would get on this, when they, got what, when they accomplished what they wanted to do and were heading back out to the farm, we would hook on behind their sled, their horse-drawn sled. <clears throat> And of course, probably the snow, the snowplow, well, I don't know how often the snowplow came around, but in those small towns, not too often, 
So anyway, we had a nice ride out in the country behind their sled, and then we'd see one coming the opposite direction, we'd cross it over and hang on to him and go back into town. <laughs> Sounds like fun. <laughs> sure. Uh, Did you, yeah. was that okay? Did your mom and dad, uh, Oh yeah, it was, was okay, fun. all right. Yeah, the kids, um, I think uh, kids in that area did pretty much what they wanted to do for fun, you know. They, and I don't recall any of them ever getting into trouble, so they just, you know. They made their own fun. Lots of imagination. Mm -hmm. Now in 1936, you graduated from high school <clears throat> and uh, you headed to Des Moines. I understand yes. that. Um, what kind of a job did you have in Des Moines? Well, of course, the, the, the reason I went to Des Moines early, before September when school started, I, I went there probably in the middle of July or so to, to get a uh, job where I'm er, earning my meals. So I would, I got a job at the Kirkwood Hotel and I would go down and bust dishes or, or something like that for an hour and then I'd have a meal and I'd do the same at noon. And I had about a, I'll bet, a 1022. That was a mile north of town, you know, from downtown. We lived at 1022 7th Street then. I can remember the number. And, uh, so, and then at noon, I'd walk back down, work an hour to get my meal, and I did that for about six weeks before school started. And believe me, I was bored. <laughs> but anyway, I, that, I, that's when, and uh, kind of interesting, I don't know how I, how I graduated so early, but I graduated at 16, and of course my birth is in June, so shortly thereafter I was 17, and I was 17 when I went to AIB school. So, um, you're busing tables, you're going to AIB, which is the business college in Des Moines. Mm -hmm. Tell me a little bit about why, why did you pick AIB? Why did, why did that appeal to you? Well, I, uh, the, situ uh, the financial problem was real serious then, and I knew Dad couldn't afford to send me to, you know, four years of college. So I just chose AIB because it's a one-year course, and the, the sales rep who came out and talked to me and my dad uh, assured us that they would help me get a job. So that made sense. So I went there to take, uh, I, I like bookkeeping and arithmetic, that sort of thing. So I took a book, bookkeeping course, but to be sure I'd get a job if there wasn't book, be, bookkeeping available, I wanted a, uh, I took some shorthand. Now, I think this is probably a, a female type uh, uh, study, but I wanted to be able to get a job, so I took it, and it was very helpful. And did that lead to a job for you? Yes, it sure did. I had one job with a weather stripping company that I took dictation from the boss for, but more, more important was when I had a chance, my friend was a uh, male secretary, at the uh, Des Moines Register for the uh, advertising manager. So he was wanted to go to Iowa City to get his education after he'd earned some money. <clears throat> and so I took over his job as secretary for the advertising manager. And how long did you do that? About a year. Mm -hmm. And the best part of that is that's where I learned to love flying was because Right next to my desk was Charlie Gatchett's desk, and he was a pilot for the uh, Register and Tribune. And, and of course, when they'd get a call of something exciting here or there, Charlie would be called on to fly up there and take some pictures and fly back and take it to the paper to print the next day or that night. So I had an opportunity to fly several times with Charlie Gatchett. He turned out to be a good friend. He's older than me, but a good friend. And uh, that's when I learned to fly. I loved to fly. I, of course, I didn't fly then. And but <clears throat> I mean, I did. I would go out to the airport and uh, park out there and watch these, you know, big old DC-3, <laughs> uh, which today is a very small airplane, but we would watch it come in and land and, and drool and hope someday <laughs> I might be able to fly. Now, um, we'll get you your involvement just in World War II in just a second, but um, before World War II, I think, were you also involved in some real estate in Des Moines? <clears throat> well, not necessarily. I worked in a real estate office, the largest one in Des Moines, Chamberlain Kirk, and uh, Art Chamberlain and jo 
Joe Chamberlain and Art Kirk. And they were, uh, they were good people. I, I enjoyed working for them. But I was in their insurance department. Mm -hmm. So I, they sold lots of insurance, and of course that led us to have lots of uh, potential customers who would follow up from the insurance department and see if we could handle their automobile insurance and mm -hmm. household insurance and so forth. So I was in the insurance department. Um, Neighborhood of Eagles, a book by Norm Rudy, talks a lot about your experience in World War II. And um, just for the record, I want to let people know that I'm, I'm not ignoring it because it's in a very important part of your life, but because I want to skip to where you are in Ames, we're going to jump over World War II for just a second. What is fine. 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 So um, after World War II, I, uh, what happened? <clears throat> well, I want to... <clears throat> I want to say this in, in regard to World War II. <coughs> People, <coughs> there, were, there was more to it than what the guys that went overseas. I, I, I just uh, think that everybody was involved in that war. Mm -hmm. you know, even the people at home on their rationing and couldn't mm -hmm. get tired and, and couldn't get sugar and all that. But okay, uh, enough about World War II. Now you want to go back to when? After World War II, um, uh, you needed to be employed. What you what you do? Well, I when I was overseas, I knew that I wanted to. I didn't want a job where I had to go out and sell something. I wanted a job that somebody came to me. And so I, uh, I bought a fourth interest in a dry cleaning plant in Des Moines. And of course, that's where the people come to have their mm -hmm. clothes cleaned so forth. And uh, I was there about a year and a half. And and at that point, and that the reason I got out of there, of course, was because the union were, it was a wicked union. And they were striking because one man was laid off, and they were so bad they broke the windows in our front, the front of our store, and through, uh, uh, oh, uh, not acid, but oh, so, oh, something all over the clothes and ruined the batch of clothes we had there. And uh, it ruined our, and then put, uh, broke into our story where we had a, a car or trucks for delivery and poured uh, sugar, I think it was, in the gas tank and that ruined the motors. So we had a real hard time and it, it really broke uh, us. Uh, I, uh, Mealy, Walt Mealy was my partner and senior partner. He had three quarters of an interest and he was a very good attorney in Des Moines. But you don't fight unions, and so they, they, uh, I, I knew I had to do something, and it was very timely that my good friend, who I was a roommate, was a roommate in uh, a rooming house while I was going to the IB, he told me that he, he was working for Ford Motor in their plant in Des Moines. He had a pretty good job, he'd been there quite a while. Anyway, he had a chance, they gave him the opportunity to open a Lincoln Mercury dealership in Ames, Iowa. And he asked me if I'd want to go with him. Of course, it was very timely because I was pretty much out of a job. You know, we had, we had to close the dry cleaning plant. So this and is maybe 1946, 1947? 47. 47. Mm -hmm. So we went up in 40, to Ames in 47, we looked the town over, and decided we had to find a uh, location for our dealership. And um, I don't know how we ever got it done, but we bought a tavern on Main Street. There weren't any big buildings out and around or any appropriate building for dealership. So we bought this dealership, or this uh, beer tavern, and tore out the bar and put a hole in the wall on the side for cars to come in and out. And uh, we had a garage and we could service three cars for repairs, plus one on the hoist to change oil and so forth. So we had a four-star, four uh, four-stall garage. So I, th I think you told me earlier it's 111 Main Street. Yes, 111 Main Street. 111 Main Street, and that's towards the east end of e Main east Street. East end of town, right. And east. it's on the north side of the street. Yeah, about three doors off of Duff Avenue. Exactly. Yeah. So there you are. There's Floyd Pincus, who's a car dealership then. All of a sudden. Pardon me? What did you say? So how many cars are you selling now? 
all well, see, Jack's job at Lincoln Mercury, my partner, his job at Lincoln Mercury was to say how many cars Spencer, Iowa got and how many cars Marshalltown got. And um, I'll have to admit, there was a lot of politics there because, you know, uh, the, the guy from Podunk Center would give Jack a little radio for, you know, buttering him up, but Spencer, Iowa would give him a car. And that's that's the way the that's the way the that's, that's the way it worked the, then. Yeah, so we had good good deal. We would have 10, 12, 14 cars a month to sell, and uh, Marshalltown might have two or three. But the the guy that was a allotting these distribution of cars, we we did like we Jack you took care of him. He gave the distributor one. I, I remember we weren't there two months when he gave him a convertible. You know. And I thought, wow, but that, it, it proved out because we got four, five, six cars more than anybody else. You know. And uh, your friend's last name was Jack? Jack Hepner. He Jack Hepner. Yes, okay. it was H-O-E-P-P-N-E-R. Okay. Uh, he was a real, very, I think he was a very intelligent guy, a nice guy, mm -hmm. good guy. Did you, did you like the car business? Yes, it was fun to see somebody get a new car, but it had its uh, downside too because uh, they weren't making the best car then. The, the farmer that bought a car and drove out over his gravel road, man, he could hardly breathe there were the dust coming in. So we'd have to undercoat and try and do this and try and do that. So we had our problems, and um, but the, the biggest problem was that uh, we had the company to deal with, and we had the customers. So we're not, you know, there's people, some of these people aren't very happy. Mm -hmm. And the Ford Motor Company would send us $2,000 worth of obsolete part and say, this is your fair share. They would just send them to us, and we'd take them to the junk because they weren't any good. Uh, but then bill us for them, because they said, you're the ones that are making the money now, and so you kind of share in on the expenses here. Mm -hmm. That was a bad deal. <clears throat> anybody, uh, any car sales particularly that you remember or anybody uh, who's still living in Ames that you sold a car to? Oh yeah, uh, the Lincoln Cosmopolitan was a big tank, it was a big car. I can remember there's still a Cosmopolitan down at uh, Harry Truman's museum in Kansas or Missouri, mm -hmm. Missouri, I think, isn't it? Well, I think it's Kansas City, Missouri, yes. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, I saw this and I couldn't believe that we owned so far. But <clears throat> I wish I could remember the farmer south of Bain, but I can't think. Oh, uh, the, re the restaurant people, uh, Bob. Let me come back to that. Come back to it. Yeah. I, I, I uh, turned out to be, he was a good friend. But he bought one of these big cosmopolitans. Uh, Mac, Mac. Oh, Bob Mac. It's going to come to you. Yeah. you know, your mind will relax and it'll come back. Okay. Anyway, uh, he, I, we sold it, a car to him. And then we, oh, there's a friend of mine who I knew went into the, into the cadet with me from Des Moines. Mm -hmm. We sold him a car. Uh, we sold a lot of cars in a Good. couple of years. So you're enjoying selling cars, but it sounds as if it wasn't the best match for you because you're kind of getting squeezed from the company. Yes. And of course you have customers and they have their needs, so. See, we had the advantage of my brother who was, who was a silent partner. He had a roller skating rink in Colorado Springs. And so we made a big deal, the, my two brothers and Jack Everett Forrest. So, I owned one-fourth of his rink, he owned one-fourth of the dealership here, and so forth. So we all owned a fourth. But Jerry had, uh, oh, we could see what, he was making good money, he had nobody to talk to or answer to. He would just keep his skating rink clean and, and have good music, uh, organ music to skate with, and he was making money. So we thought that looked simple. <laughs> so that's how we got involved with thinking. 
and then we decided to uh, build a skating rink here. Mm -hmm. That's that. So then we built one, planted the one down on South Duff. How did you get the land on South Duff? What was there before? Cornfield. Cornfield. There was a two-lane highway and an open ditch for a storm sewer. We had a bridge over that open ditch, and then we on this building this cornfield. We bought uh, from Mrs. Kaler four four hundred and twenty feet on South Duff, and that was it was it was a cornfield. Mm -hmm. And do you want to you want you want to talk figures? Well, sure. Let's talk figures. How much did you buy it for? Twelve thousand dollars. It's uncanny. We bought that for twelve thousand dollars, and. Uh, and did you sell the car dealership partly to fund this then? No. No. Uh, the, for, they, the manager in Des Moines was getting uh, a lot of uh, kickback from other dealers in town, in Iowa, saying, boy, your new boys in Ames, Iowa are really making money and they're going to go skating. You know? And they just pushed him to the point where he had to do something. So he told us, we had to be, we this bear in mind we had this twenty five foot garage and we had this new big building for skating we're going up mm -hmm. so he said you're going to have to build a new skating rent a new bo uh, automobile dealership block for block you know so, so we uh, but in the meantime people from Ames came to us and said please build a bowling alley don't build a skating rink we need a bowling you know a uh, bowling alley. That's what they called it. I still call it a bowling center. <laughs> but anyway, so um, we did then, as I said, we had 420 feet, so we had room on the south side for the skating and a lot of room on the north side for the bowling. So we, in our own mind, we're starting a bowling building, but we're telling Ford Motor this is a garage, you know, and we had them believing that until it couple months went by, we still got cars, and we were still dealership, but then we, when it got up high enough, we had to tell them, well, we decided we're going to go into the bowling business, and we'd like to sell our dealership. So they helped us find a, a buyer for it. And um, so that was the last of a car dealer on Main Street. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a tavern. It was a tavern now. Well, I guess it started there, and it cycled back to that. Uh, right. Deal. So um, Jerry was successful in the roller skating business, and you've got your you've got your land. So you've decided that um, you got the skating rink up first, yes. right? That yep. skating rink we up. We opened, I think, about in May with the skating rink. Was, am I getting maybe to 1949 or so? It was 1949, exactly. Okay. All right. A couple of years after we had the day. Was there another skating rink in Ames at the time? There was a summer skating rink up okay. by Cars Pool. Mm -hmm. Pop Car had a, uh, a rink that they could skate in in the summertime, but it wasn't enclosed. Mm -hmm. So, it wasn't so you really got into that niche first. You yes. really captured yes. that yeah, idea. We were the only okay. skating rink. Tell me about how you decided what to put your appointments inside. Was it like, I don't know, a maple floor or what? what how well, did you fortunately, decide? we had the experience of Jerry's in business up there. Mm -hmm. And he bought an old skating rink and got a good start. And then he built a new one. Mm -hmm. So he kind of, you know, through him we knew what kind of a floor. <clears throat> yes, it was a uh, maple floor. Mm -hmm. and, and those boards were screwed together. They weren't nailed. Mm -hmm. it was very tight. And very, it was a beautiful, good floor. Mm -hmm. And it was uh, 60 feet wide and 150 feet long. And was that a standard size for skating rink at that time? Or was that it bigger than most? It to be. Okay. <clears throat> now that's just the skating floor. Then yes, on yes. the side of that area, we had 30 feet of uh, oh, the, the restrooms and then we had a little sell or, you mm -hmm. know, bar to sell pop and stuff, mm -hmm. and then the skate rental department and so mm -hmm. on. You know. um, that's fun. I, you, it was a business that gave people smiles. Yes. And, oh, the, really, it went, it went over right from the day one because, oh, kids just loved it. 
and uh, you know they love to roller skate, but it's the sidewalk isn't always the best place to do it. So it was a wonderful way, and it was not too expensive. They could they could skate. Tell me about um, did you open with the big splash? Yes, we did. We we had uh, a, a formal opening or grand opening, uh, and lots of newspaper ads, and we had the Everly Brothers in there to sing. So they'd skate a while, and then they'd sing, and they just spent the evening with us. And uh, that's big name. Yeah, it was then. It, it that was still a big is. Still, yes. But my gosh, that's that was nineteen forty-six. That's seventy years ago. They must be pretty old by now. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me a little bit about how music was selected, or how, how what was the music like at skating? Well, I wish I could remember. The, we had a, a large 12-foot uh, wide and high uh, machine to play the records. Mm -hmm. So we could put six records in for the waltz or six records mm -hmm. in for the uh, girls only and so forth. Mm -hmm. So there was a, it was a very, that played most of the time. But on certain nights, we had Winona Mylenbush from Boone came over and played the organ, and she played the organ for us for 12 years. Beautiful. What fun. And she just had fun watching the kids mm -hmm. skate during music. Is there, are there some legacies of Skateland that, I mean, people that you know and remember skating there? Well, one pr very prominent one, and... Uh, Gary Thompson, the all-star uh, basketball player, m I met his wife, present wife, uh, Janet. Janet, but I can't think of her last name from Huxley. Mm -hmm. But the two, he was from Roland Isle, north of Ames. She was from Huxley, south of Ames, and they met and they would skate a lot, and and the. Uh, Oh, there's, I wish I could remember the kids that used to skate there a lot, like Gary, but I know uh, Tachi Taronis and his brothers from Ames, they, they, well, one worked as a pro, they're already teaching, and I think the other one helped us just helping in a maintenance, mm -hmm. uh, George, I think, George, or one of the Taronis boys. But they were good, they are good people, we, we uh, enjoyed having them help us. I don't want to cut Skateland short too much, but it uh, it met its end because of some weather. Yes, in nineteen uh, oh, I don't know. I thought I had it down. Yes, I think it was about nineteen sixty. We built it in forty nine. I think about nineteen sixty or early sixties. A tornado took the roof off. Uh, it was in sometime in July. Fortunately, this happened about six o'clock in the morning. There wasn't anybody in the building, and there were any cars out on the lot. But it took the roof in one big chunk and lifted it up and upside down out in the, in the parking lot. Yeah. So then it continued raining for a half a day or so, and that old maple was just waves, you know. And uh, I wish I'd have thought about it at the time to put a pair of skates on and go up and down this way. It looked <laughs> like it might have been fun. But we, but so then we decided not to rebuild, and I don't really know why, except, oh, well, yeah, my Bob, Bob Pankers, who started and opened the rink, he moved out to Colorado and to go into, because he wanted to get back in the car business. He liked it. And Jack Hepner, our uh, partner, he had then, in the meantime, bought a rink over in uh, uh, Waterloo. So he went, we moved over to Waterloo, actually Cedar Falls, and he had a nice rink over there. And about that time, then he decided that he would like to just go on his own. And so he, you know, he dropped out of our partnership. Then it was just the three brothers. Mm -hmm. But um, so you didn't. So you had people, you had management expertise that were g going their own ways, and uh, was is it possible that roller skating inside was it as, as popular as it was in the 1940s? No, it dropped down. Mm -hmm. I don't know why, but uh, then when Bob 
went out, my brother Bob went out to Colorado, then uh, my cousin, Jim Kathman, uh, uh, decided he would take over the rink and rent it. So he rented it for four or five years. And then he, I think, got a little uh, Alzheimer's or something. And uh, so he had, he wanted to, but anyway, just, oh no, I rented it to a good operator from Des Moines. And he was doing better because mm -hmm. he had four rings in Des Moines. He knew what he was doing. And John something from Des Moines. I was um, thinking that we kind of go back a little bit to um, the bowling center for just a little bit because um, you had said that people were coming to you and saying, well, yeah, uh, skating rink sounds great, but what we really need is a bowling center, bowling alley yes. in Ames. Was there a bowling alley in Ames in 1949, though? Yes, there was a little, six lanes up above where Luke Lance now is. But it was uh, a really makeshift. Uh, I think it was shorter, probably, than normal. And there's no lobby for them to, you know... Uh, no socializing, you couldn't... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just barely enough for them to sit down and bowl. And anyway, uh, I, th I wish I could think of his name. I, I, it was too bad, but then I guess that's considered progress. You know? <laughs> the guys came to us and wanted an abonia, so we, we realized they were serious, and, and, and we had real good luck. We, they, they, we filled it up with leagues in a matter of a year or two, and it was going strong. So uh, this is about, like I said, I think I said 1949, something like that, when you got the bowling right. center open. Did you have In a... October of 49, okay. we opened the bowling center. So did you have a grand opening for that, like you did for Skateland? Yes, but nobody. Don Carter was a, a national bowler champion. Uh -huh. We had him out here, uh, and, and actually Brunswick helped us. We put Brunswick bowling lanes in, mm -hmm. and... Uh, so Brunswick helped help him. We paid part in Brunswick part to hire this guy to come out. And mm -hmm. he was there all day that day. Oh, fun. Yeah, real good boy. I wish I could think of some of the tricks he, he was so good at. But he was just a good bowler. The um, bowling business requires some nurturing. In other words, I know you'd said that you didn't want to have to go out and sell things, but I would think you had to kind of go out and sell some businesses to get leagues and yeah, that sort of thing. Did. Yeah, every uh, day. But, you know, like, I remember going up to Story City and down to Huxley, and I got a team or two here and a team or two there, and we, we that way we formulated a uh, Story County League, and that was successful. And they, they, were, they were still going when I left in 1993. Maybe a little rivalry between Huxley yeah, and Roland yeah, yeah, and they had fun. some town pride. But then, and like another thing, I, I uh, organized a merchant's league, so I went all over our town and just got the local merchants. Mm -hmm. And then the Elks Club had been bowling up at the little place, and it was no problem to go from six, lane, six teams to 12 in the Elks Club. Mm -hmm. And the Moose Club had a couple of teams here and there. We had good luck. And, and then, the, of course, the ladies, uh, I don't know that they, yeah, they bowled upstairs. They did. They had the ladies' league. But we, we had uh, several good ladies' leagues after we opened up to it. And um, well, people just like to bowl. People like to come and be together. Did, did, you, mm -hmm. did you hang around and talk with some of the people that, would come in at their leagues? Oh, I had to talk to some. They had, they, they talked when I wasn't in the mood to, probably. <laughs> but, you know, they would, my, once in a while, somebody would up and complain that the lanes are too goily or they're not oily enough, you know. And, of course, you agree with them and you back and go on about <laughs> your work. But um, it was not, it was not bad. They, mm -hmm. the, I was, uh, they came in to have a good time and, and if they wanted to talk, I'd talk. Mm -hmm. yeah. And um, why do you think bowling was popular? Do people, do you hear people talk about, well, back when I was in bowling league, it was because they made business contacts, or what, 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 what made it popular in Well, a lot of, like, I can, um, uh, I 
can't think of his name, but had the Pontiac garage here. He was a good friend of Margaret's and mine, but he would pay for their, some good sponsors would have a team and pay for their bowling, like uh, he did. And, uh, and, and the, but they, there are a lot of teams. Some pay for their bowlers and paid their bowlers to pay, and some didn't. But uh, yes, oh, Best Electric had a team, and I can just, you know, lots of teams like that. You know, you had some um, ways to pull a lot of bowlers in from other areas, in, in addition to Story County. Now, I'm going to say the Olds Bowl yeah, was one right, of your projects. Yeah, Olds Bowl. When did that start? Um, I would say about. 1960, for 18 years, we for 18 years we had this annual Oldsmobile, where we gave away a car for first place, and maybe the second place got $500. Yeah, in that day it was a big tournament. I I know I, I won't I can't take credit for that. Oh, Jack Hepner was a smart car boy. He was smart, and he dreamt up this tournament. And he promoted it and, and uh, very successful. And then, uh, while well, he was only there for one or two terms, and from then on, I had it myself. But then he had he had established it. Mm -hmm. But to give a car away was a, really something, and we were kind of proud of that. We gave eighteen years in a row, and then something happened. It was there was a gas shortage in the eighties there, or something. Well, then also. When we started this, we were paying maybe $2,000, 2500 $2, for a car. Mm -hmm. And, you know, 18 years later, cars got it around $5,000, and it was getting pretty hard to pay for a car and mm -hmm. give it away. So I think that's a problem. It was a combination. There, I know there was a shorty gas, and we had people from, uh, I know, from Minnesota coming down. Well, mm -hmm. they just, with the gas problem, they couldn't do it. So it was so a good time to quit. So you're located on South Duff, mm -hmm. and um, when did it kind of start growing up around you? When did you kind of get like a restaurant nearby and all that kind of stuff, and you get more company? Well, let me tell you. Let me tell you about our growth. We had twelve lanes, mm -hmm. and uh, the uh, there's there's some people here from town decided they're going to build a new bowling alley north of town, and. Uh, I talked to him, and my two brothers had gone, my two brothers were in Colorado and well established out there, and I said, why don't you buy my bowling center, and uh, I'll go on out to Colorado where my brothers are. And they said, nope, we want the most beautiful bowling alley in the country. And uh, so uh, I thought, oh, you know, I thought, new bowling alley, that's going to make, you know, break my back. And I didn't want to get involved. But since they wouldn't listen to me, they opened the bowling center. But they are a little bit dictatorial, telling their customers what to do and so forth. And uh, they opened in 1958, just about 10 years after we did. And I thought that, you know, a new bowling center would just take all my business. But I lost six teams to go out there, so it wasn't hurting. In 1958, they built this. In 1960, with their new bowling center, it created enough activity that I added on 12 lanes in 1960. <laughs> and that's the truth. Okay, now I've got 24 lanes, and uh, I would say about 1965, they closed the doors. It, it's out of town, hard for women to go out there at night, mm -hmm. and I had the local best location, so. I, yeah, so I, I really was lucky. Okay. Can you uh, refresh my memory on where that was? Sure, north of town. On 69? Uh, on six, fifth, six. Highway 69 or? 69, yeah. We'll go, run right by our place and then over to Grand and out north of town. Yeah. Um, I wish I knew what How far there. north? About two, three miles. Miles. And so north it of the lake, out there. no north of the lake. So it doesn't exist anymore, or is it that it's um, a moose club? It's now. a moose club now. Okay, they, all right. They took out the gutters from the bowling lanes and put but in the uh, lanes up. That was beautiful mm -hmm. dance floor. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, it's at least the building has been recycled uh, 
successfully. Yes, <laughs> yes, sure. So, um, tell me a little bit about uh, the Ames business people that you um, enjoyed working with over your long history. Here. Well, well, there's, let's see, it's going to take a lot of thinking. <laughs> Best Electric, Orlo Best was a very enthused bowler, and Bob Best, his son, and uh, now Bob Best has a son, Bob Best, who is a coach at Ames High. So it was Best Electric, uh, uh, the Pontiac, uh, I'm going to think of his name before I'm through. Pontiac dealer, uh, all the restaurants, mm -hmm. uh, Hostetter's restaurant south of town. Do you remember Hostetter's restaurant? Okay. They were there, and uh, oh, my good, good friend who had his uh, sheet metal shop, Paul Jones, across the street, mm -hmm. he and I were on the first ones down there, so we became good friends. Um, because at that time, Main Street was still the driving commercial force. Yes, indeed. It yeah. was still the driving commercial force. So you were um, a different angle on the commerce. Right, right. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm not coming up with any names of these. No, no, I, no worries. Back in the day of car later. hardware, you know, when I was car hardware. Mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, and the pizza places, would they were all like to add. Mm -hmm. So, um, as you think about your years of um, being in Ames and the uh, Skateland and the uh, Bowling Center, we've not talked about the movie theater, but maybe we just better do that right now. You build a movie theater, that so you really had an entertainment Yes. complex down yeah. there and you built the entertainment center in about what year was it or the not uh, the movie center the movie center was built in 19 uh 69. see i'm thinking that the skateland went away in like 68 was kind that's of right like, that's I, it's kind of what I was in 1968 the reason exactly. i know that yeah mr pinkus is because i was in high school <laughs> Is that right? And I remember that, yeah. Did you skate? Oh, of course I skated there. Okay. Yeah. And so that's why I, I, that was kind of coming back to me. It was yeah. kind of a big event then. Yeah, the, the skate, when the, the skating rink then was torn down, and the steel beams from that building is now out on East Lincoln Way. Uh, I, I think that's where the uh, cement. Uh, you know, ready mix plant is. You were recycling before it was trendy. <laughs> <laughs> well, Bud Overon was a wonderful man, in my opinion. He was a local contractor. Uh, he he he, uh, he said, "I'll tear it down if you give me the steel." So I said, "Go at it," and so he did. And then uh, Bud built my theater building. He's a good good friend, a good guy. And that and, was built in 1969. Okay. And then um, it closed uh, partially due to some of the flooding and partially due to the, a new movie theater coming in. They, they had been flooded thoroughly twice. Mm -hmm. And uh, then uh, uh, shortly after, or maybe it was about at the same time as the 1970 flood, the new, no, no, 1990, after their second flood, they... Uh, De decided well, and the move and the twelve new twelve theaters are here, mm -hmm. and I rented to Mr. Blank from Des Moines, who had all the theaters in Des Moines. He had all the his names too, and so uh, I rented him, and he was a genuine good guy. He did lots for Des Moines, and uh, he was just a good man. But anyway, uh, he decided he wasn't his. It just so happened. His lease was up in January, and that flood came in uh, July, and he said he didn't think he would renew it because of the new theaters and the flooding, he mm -hmm. kind of had it. So then uh, I made the mistake, or we did when we built it, of 
building it down into the ground, you know, sloping into the ground so the back seat was high, but the back row of chairs was at ground level and the front row is, you know, 12 feet underground or something down below. So the building was not good for anything and um, I could see we had a problem. And the, the taxes were sixteen, seventeen thousand dollars a, a year, so we decided to tear it down and look for something else. And eventually, we sold it as a lot, a big mm -hmm. lot. Your enterprises, the bowling center, and um, Skateland, and the movie complex, provided a lot of enjoyment for a lot of people. I, is that one of you feel one of your legacies to Ames, or do you have have other things that you feel like you made a, an imprint on Ames? Well, I was lucky. Uh, I was real lucky to uh, have succeeded, and you know I I uh, had the theater long enough to I was more than paid for. Uh, no, I I think I, I I don't know. I was just lucky. I you know. Uh, I did. I had no. I had no thought of making a lot of money or wealth. I just wanted to be successful, and I, and that was enough. You know, and I think I was because they all paid off. I, I've never had to close the doors because of no business. I, a tornado took care of it, or a flood took care of it, or something else. <laughs> Thank you so much for talking to me, Mr. No, Floyd Pinkus. It's been a pleasure. And I apologize if I talk too much. Nope, there's no such thing as too many words. Okay. I'm talking with Floyd Pincus, who's a longtime resident of Ames, Iowa, and a very successful business person here. Um, in the process of talking to him about Ames, um, he was telling me about coming from Templeton, Iowa, and that made me think of a beverage that, uh, beverage. <laughs> <laughs> that is available in Templeton. So your dad had a, a general goods store, mm. and uh, as a kid, did you have any idea about what Templeton Rye was? Yes, because... Oh, the, the guy right across the street, my cousin, uh, his name was Bill Martis, and, the, and I had, a, he had a couple, of, well, they had 10 kids, and a couple of them were about my age, so, you know, I would go over there a lot, we'd play ball together, and, but, you know, Dad said, well, you, you can go over to Lamb Swallows, but, you, you, you know, you're not going to be able to go downstairs, so don't embarrass me, you, you, you can't go downstairs, because that's where there still is. So we, we knew pretty much who had a still in their basement and who didn't. Right. And um, they were, what was the grain they were using to, for their still? Rye. Their rye. rye. So there was a lot of rye. They grew a lot of rye, rye in that area. And um, why was it that, now this is during the Prohibition. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So who were the customers? I mean, this is, could be dangerous business. They're all over. I can remember when my, uh, a clothing salesman from Chicago was out, and he, uh, you know, after he showed dad, my dad samples and they were through, dad had me help him carry the suitcases out to the car, and when I got out to here, he had this big Buick sedan with a four, uh, wooden back seat, not a back seat, but a platform. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, he, had lo he had lots of uh, clothing samples, but he also had some jugs and then of the Temple and Rye and bought, bought some rye to take back to Chicago. So at that time there wasn't a plant because obviously that would have been totally illegal but how many households do you think had stills in them in Templeton? A lot. I, I, would, uh, I would exaggerate probably if I said one every other one but I'll bet uh, three out of ten homes had a still in it. Now, what well, are the ingredients for 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 this rye? I really don't know. <laughs> do they need no. sugar, or what are they? What are they oh doing? yeah, lots yeah. of sugar. Uh, and so, did and, they buy sugar from your dad? Yes, some sugar from my dad. Yeah, uh -huh. but 
I, I don't know how or who handled it, but somehow I heard that they, that they were shipping it in by carloads, or, ra or even by rail, a lot of it. And I don't know who handled that or how. What were they shipping in? I'm sorry. Sugar. 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 Okay. You know, my yeah, dad you need a lot. Sell. He just yeah. sold a lot, but he, so he yeah. didn't sell all of it. Let me tell you something about the uh, sheriff in Carroll County, Frank Bookhite. He, uh, he had it set up with his office. He liked the people in Templeton around, Breed and all those towns around. You know, he was a good guy and, and they were, maybe it was illegal, but they were making money mm -hmm. and, and they were able to feed their family and mm -hmm. so forth. And uh, anyway, Sheriff B Frank Buckeye uh, had his, his girls in the office know, well, he never wore a cap. But if he put his cap on, that meant that when the feds came, you know, the feds would come to Frank and say, we're going to go down to Temple. And so he, you know, see, just put his cap on and they knew that's what's going on. So they would call down to Templeton and alert everybody. And, uh, and they just somehow hid, you know, if they weren't hiding it too well, they would hide it better. <laughs> and uh, it, it was real good. That was interesting. But, but, and I think everybody, I was never embarrassed or uh, apologized for Templeton Rye. Uh, it may have been illegal according to Uncle Sam, but it still was good living for them. Mm -hmm. They made something that somebody wanted. Mm -hmm. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, I mean, now there's a quite a fine distillery there. There did, is. I did your family have any connections with this distillery getting started? No, 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 but I know people who did because I went out to the grand opening a couple of years ago and two couples went along with Kyle and me and uh, I said on the way out I said now I've been I left there in 1936 mm -hmm. so I you know it's been that's a long time ago. I don't suppose I'm gonna know a soul but I'm going to find the oldest guy there and ask him if he just remembers my name. Which I did. I saw this old guy in, in, at, during the grand opening and I said, you mind telling me what your name is? He said, it's Karakov. And I said, any relation to Alphonse Karakov? And he said, he's my granddad. And so uh, I said, well, he said, were you? Oh, and I said, well, does the name Pankus mean anything? And he kind of roamed his eyes. He said, were you a pilot? And I said, yeah, I was in World War II. And he said, well, you are the one that flew over my dad's farm. And he said, you scared every chicken on our farm off the floor of the fence. He said, that wasn't so bad. We got the chickens back, but they never laid another egg the rest of their life. <laughs> so we had, a, we had a real good back now this. So then he called his son over, but this, uh, his dad was 12 years old when I flew over his uh, farm. And you remember doing that? Yeah, oh sure. I was, my commanding officer in Greenville, South Carolina said, you guys are all going overseas next week. So I'm gonna give you a break. I'm gonna go do something nice for you. And so he said, you can, you can take a B-25 and fly anywhere in the United States. So I thought, oh boy, this little small town boy to fly over his hometown, I just couldn't believe it. So anyway, it was a thrill. We flew from Greenville, South Carolina up to uh, uh, Vichy, Missouri and refueled. And they called mom and dad and said, we'll be there. We're going to fly over town about 6.30. So I said, why don't you come on, you'll be looking for me. So about 6.30 we got there. And there were about 25, 30 people in my dad's yard, all waiting for me to get there. And I, I, couldn't, I couldn't believe that I was so lucky. Did you buzz them? Did you go pretty low? Uh, four times in each direction, 200 feet, because that was as high as the church steeple was, and I could tell. <laughs> but anyway, uh, and I told my co-pilot, who, who was going overseas with me, I said, now, I want you to know I'm excited, and I said, if I'm doing anything wrong, you just tap me on the shoulder and take over. But he didn't have to, because I was very careful. I came in real slow and flew over town. They had each four, every four directions. Each point of the compass, yeah. 
Huh? Each point of the compass. Yes. And I was so thrilled to, you know, this kid that grew up in a town of 350, uh, it just was unbelievable. Anyway. Um, I'm returning to the um, people who are making a living with their <clears throat> own stills. And I'm wondering, you, you mentioned Chicago, and I just wondered, was there ever any big name customer that might have? Well, would you believe Al Capone? <laughs> well, I know who that name is. <laughs> um, uh, there's I, there's a, a record, an interview that I had by the, by the one of the owners of Templeton Rye. He wanted to talk to me and hear as much as he could about somebody. He, need, he was looking for somebody real old, you know. <laughs> anyway, um, it, in this in this uh, disc on TV, I mean on the computer, where Al Capone is talking to somebody. He said he's from Iowa, and Al Capone said, "What part of Iowa?" And he named the name, and he said, "Well, I'm not familiar with that." He said, uh, uh, "But are you familiar with Carroll and Carroll County, Templeton, Iowa?" And he, no, the guy said something. But anyway, he said, "Well, I know Templeton, Iowa," and he said, <laughs> "I go out there and get liquor." I still, he said, "I've been out there times to get liquor." So you think Al Capone probably passed through? Al Capone. Al, he Al, Al Capone said he was there. Mm -hmm. I never knew it or saw him. But, but he said he had a regular. Uh, Distributor out there that made it for him. Well, um, thank Some, you for. Thank somebody you. knew him well. Yeah. Um, anything else you want to tell me about Templeton Rye? Well, one more thing. This is kind of personal. Mm -hmm. uh, my dad and I were out pheasant hunting one uh, year, and we were walking along this fence row and kicking in the grass, you know, and uh, suddenly my foot went down into a hole, and I've got a scar today on my right leg up the side where the fence, you know, my whole, my foot went down this post hole and the barbed wire just got my leg all the way up. But um, I found out, Dad said, well, that's where they hide liquor. He said, uh, he knew about it. But my uncle didn't ever make it, but he was kind of a dealer. And so, and he told me about it. And so he would sell somebody three gallons of liquor in his home in, in Templeton in town and the guy, he said, go out two miles south, one mile west, third post hole, you lift the post off of it and you get that liquor. And that's <laughs> and, how I got my, and, I have a scar in my life. It's a, a family resemblance. Well, thank you for telling me about that. <laughs> I guess you, you make me talk.